Well, over the past two years, I've interspersed our long-form interviews with high-profile Australians on the couch with the Sky News hosts that you follow so closely. Well, it's not just the nighttime hosts that have attracted a huge following here. Many of our political animals during the daytime hours have forged great careers and have enormous insight into the culture of Australian politics. One of those hosts is the AM Agenda's Laura Jays, an international correspondent and political inquisitor whose understanding of the Canberra culture is second to none. Laura Jays, welcome to the couch. Thank you. And I've got to say, this is the first time I've put pants on that don't have elastic on them in a long time. <laughs> yeah. So I've been liberating about that. It is liberating. <laughs> and heels, I feel like I need to learn to walk again. But anyway, yes, here we are. It's a bit like that. It's hard to believe that you only started specialising in politics in around 2011. You have a great grasp of the strategy and the culture. Thank you. It can be an enthralling thing to follow, can't it? Yeah, it's an absolutely fascinating pursuit. Um, looking at it from where we do every day is the best place to be, I think. And sometimes I wonder why these people do it. <laughs> why would you go into it? Um, it's really hard to get things done. I think people, um, I think sometimes the wrong people go into it as well. I often think, you know, people with a big profile outside of politics go into uh, politics and I often wonder whether they could have just done more from the outside like they were doing, but it is a, a noble pursuit. I think the the glamour, um, some of the nobility has come out of it. But look, I, I think I have a good perspective because I didn't grow up with it. I don't, I was not interested in politics. In, in fact, when my last boss asked me to go to Canberra, my immediate reaction was no way. I don't want to go. Right. I'm not interested in politics. And here I am. <laughs> there you are. It is everything you do. The scrutiny on our politicians yeah. today, like nothing before. And this is why so many women in particular, I think, yeah. you talk about those who want to be candidates, they, they have second thoughts. The ones that I've spoken to, I don't want to be scrutinised the way they are. Yeah, they don't. And, look, I don't think it's just women, but we still have this situation where women are still traditionally taking on that homemaker role, and that hasn't quite shifted. In some households it does. In ours it's very different, you know, it's very much equal. But why would you put up, put up with that? And it's still... And not so much in the parliament, but the pre-selections, they're still very much boys' clubs, yeah. I mean, because they've got the time and, and deals are still done at golf or at the pub and... You know, so that really hasn't changed. But, I mean, we also risk, Chris, I think, setting these standards for politicians and people in public life that really, if we're honest with ourselves, none of us could meet. No, because the rest of us are human. We expect them to be superhuman in many yeah, ways. Exactly. I want to come back to you, though. When you've got into all of this, you've found, especially in this format, that you had to ad-lib endlessly... <laughs> Yeah. This is not something you're taught at university. No, it's not. And it's not something that I did at university. I mean, I did a sports journalism degree <laughs> because I was interested in snow skiing uh, and <laughs> didn't even like football. So there you go. Uh, you make some funny decisions when you're young. But here we are. It's, it's, it's worked for me, I guess. Um, look, no, uh, ad-libbing is something that I do daily. I use the, you know, we all have auto cue. That's not a secret in television now, but I really use it as a guide yeah. because things move so quickly. Mm. So you write scripts in the morning, um, which I do, but then by the time you're going to air with them, they do change a lot. And um, I feel like we've got a, a, a relationship with our audience where they're expecting to know the most up-to-date mm. information right then and there. Mm. Um, I'm not the expert. I'm certainly the facilitator of, though, in, in trying to get that information out. I think you underplay yourself. <laughs> Tell me about the colour of politics. Are we taking yeah. the colour out? I think of I Barnaby Joyce and yeah. Bob Catter. I get excited before I interview either of those men because yeah. I know I'm going to get something colourful. But are we, taking, are we making our politicians too bland? Yeah. Are the parties making them into media-savvy robots, do you think? Well, I think there's an element of that. I mean, we have to be careful to remember that politics is an entertainment um, and Barnaby Joyce can be very entertaining indeed. But it goes back to that thing that we were just talking about, that, that we're setting standards that none of us uh, can meet, particularly when it comes to people like Barnaby Joyce. You know, there's so much... Um, focus on him and he's at a stage in his career where he doesn't 
really care. He, he doesn't give a damn. He's speaking over the head of a lot of people. He's speaking to the people that will vote for him. He doesn't really care about um, inner city uh, lefties and what they think of him. Um, and he's got a thick skin. I mean, no one's quite like Barnaby Joyce. But, look, I, I, I think that you need those characters. Yes. And it is a pleasure to interview uh, Barnaby Joyce because he believes in something. But he's not alone. I mean, Peter Dutton is a divisive figure. He is a pleasure to interview because you know he, you, you're going to get an answer from him, not just these party lines. Mm. I mean, the, the great pleasure in interviewing people like that. And, you know, Tanya Plibersek, Chris Bowen, I would also uh, put in that category as well. And some of the crossbenchers too, when, when they believe in something, they're there for a reason, not just to be re-elected to be a body on the backbench or, uh, you know, just to be a time server. I want to talk further about politics in the future with you in just yeah. a second, but let's go back 10 years. You went to Afghanistan yeah. and you were there for the new or first girls' school that was built yeah. by Australia. Yep. It was a really incredible landmark for, for, for young girls' yep. freedom and, and democracy. Just have a quick look at that story. Ten years ago, scenes like this just didn't exist. Now, there's 29 schools across the Aruzgan province and more and more women and young children are going to school. Does it upset you now, ten years on, to know that those same young girls, their lives are in peril in many ways? And we don't really know where they are. I mean, these girls would be young women by now. A lot of them are probably being married off. Some of them may have even been sold. Um, ten it's years ago, there was so much hope in that school. It was just incredible. I was there with our first female Australian Governor General and Quentin Bryce. So that symmetry and all of that was quite was quite lovely. There was so much hope. They were excited um, to see me as a female reporter was mm. something that they'd they'd never seen. Just the fact that the Taliban is back in and these girls' schools just will not exist. Could we not have stayed there, Laura? You've been there. You've been down this track and thought through this, no doubt, yeah. deeply. Could we not have stayed there in some form, as we did with so many places in Europe after World War II? Well, the hope has just been removed from these young women yes. now. That, the, the hope, taking away that hope is just the most damaging thing. To, to think we could have stayed, I, I don't think so. Mm. And there's no perfect answer here, though either, Chris. I think the withdrawal was wrong. It's going to cost a lot of money and I think the irony, uh, the sad irony now is that in some weird way we really need the Taliban to succeed. In 2016 you became only the third journalist to enter Nauru and had a look at the detention yeah. centre there. You were pregnant at the time, weren't you? I was heavily pregnant. <laughs> well, I'm when I'm pregnant I'm heavy no matter what. I'm the <laughs> most unhappy pregnant person. I remember we'd booked a holiday to uh, Byron Bay, my husband and I, Alex, and then finally I'd We've been trying to work on getting this approval for so long to get into Nauru. Finally, it came through... At the wrong time. ..just before we went to Byron Bay. So, anyway, I cut the holiday short, went to Nauru, <laughs> deeply unhappy and very <laughs> pregnant. Can I just digress for a moment? I'm about five foot, give or take, and that's generous. <laughs> Um, and I put on 25 kilos, two pregnancies. So I'm like a perfect sphere, right? <laughs> so moving around Nauru in like 35 degree heat, it was, it was just a, a bit of a nightmare. But look, it was an important story to do and that's why I wanted to go there. I didn't feel unsafe going there. Um, Tell us the truth about the conditions. Yeah, look, the conditions, they've spent billions of dollars on facilities there and billions of dollars to the Nauruan government as well. Um, the facilities are fine. Um, you know, it's not luxury, it's not living, you know, beachside and Bondi, nothing like that. But the most difficult thing for people there is that they're in limbo. So yeah. it's not so much the facilities, you yeah. know, there's not... It's not st state-sanctioned torture. There is air conditioning. There are activities. They try to make it as nice as possible, but you cannot... It doesn't matter, matter how nice those conditions are. It's giving... It's those people living in limbo, not knowing yep. how the, where they're going to be in the next year, the next month, the next 10 years, really. OK, back to you, Laura Jays. Workaholic. Oh, not quite. Mum, unhappy pregnant woman we've Very just found out. deeply. <laughs> Tell us the truth about being a super mum, though. Oh. I get the feeling that you all hide the fact that it's tougher than what you <laughs> let on. 
Oh, look, it's it's not that tough. And look, deeply unhappy it's not pregnant. That tough. I'm deeply unhappy pregnant. I love being a mum though. Um, and look, this is a job that really prepared me for it. Um, not much sleep as a journalist. Not much sleep as a mother. And if you can get around that and learn to live on less sleep, I think things are a little bit easier. It's also kind of working out in your own household how you divvy everything up. And not everything's said with a kind word, I might say. Some things are said quite tersely <laughs> from time to time. But some things you just don't do that well. OK. Um, you know, so you, you kind of like a, a duck. Things are moving really rapidly below the water and you try to look like a swan on top. So yeah. Now, listen, you grew up in the Shire. You are yeah. a Cronulla girl. Was it like a scene from Puberty Blues, like <laughs> rack off you moles and things like that? Um, not quite. <laughs> I think the language has moved on slightly <laughs> since those days, but it was, it was pretty great growing up in Cronulla. You know, you're living in a cul-de-sac... You're playing with all the kids on the street. Come home when the, the street lights are on type thing. We lived on the on the water and there's a big um, there's a big river down there. So, you know, a lot of the time is spent um, away yeah. <laughs> from your parents' prying eyes, if you like. Um, and your parents parties. weren't taking you into any kind of journalistic or, or political oh areas, gosh. weren't they? But no. Not interested? Absolutely not interested in the absolute slightest. Not even close. <laughs> I, look, to be honest, I don't want to dob my parents in, but I've been at Sky News for almost 15 years. My parents have never had Foxtel. You've just dobbed them in. I know. You saw a lot of the world before you got to Sky News. You're a ski instructor in Austria, a dishwasher in Holland, a <laughs> bartender in London. Yeah. Did you know through that period of travelling the world and doing the bulk of your travel yeah. what you wanted to do? Yeah, I did. There's still a lot of things on my list to do. I just think travel is just the number one thing after having children. So I, I tried to do a lot of, like, I tried to do South America before I had kids because I don't think it's the kind of thing you can do with kids in the way yeah. I wanted to do it. So quickly, finished high school, had always skied in, in Threadbow. Mum and Dad made the decision uh, early. Um, they gave up the Gold Coast holidays a year and we just did a winter holiday. Right. So that's how it is because I'm one of four. So I'm the eldest of four. So loved it, got into skiing and... Honestly, skiing's been the foundation of my life. It has taken me to places I would never have dreamed. I've met people that I never thought I would. You so need to put I... your hand up for the Winter Olympics next time. Oh, time. gosh, no, I was never that good. I think there was too much apres ski involved, so my talent kind of waned and my fitness Maybe kind reporting of waned. on the Winter Olympics. Well, uh, well I, I did um, I do a, a lot of snow reporting in Hotham, yeah. and I also did a, a ski travel show, which was from a production company that was linked to Channel 9. Well, look, Kieran Gill can do the rugby, you can do <laughs> exactly. the snow skiing. Um, we do have our funny moments on air, and I can cannot forget when you interviewed the first ever yeah. vaccinated Australian, this World War II survivor, 84-year-old. Let's have a look at her inability to give the proper V sign. <laughs> this is the right way. Other that, way, Jane. Way. That, Other way. That. Yeah. You've got it See, now. She was great and oh, didn't recognise the Prime Minister either. Oh, she's just an absolute <laughs> angel. And I've had her on my show twice since. In fact, I had her on just the other day because she's now in line to get her booster shot. And Jane is just a wonderful, wonderful Australian. Like, she lives through so much. Um, and I love that she's not, you know, part of this Instagram-ready generation. So you get a lot of raw... Um, emotion out of her and it's just so real and we yeah. don't often get that yeah. in the interviews that yeah. we do so oh, I just love Jane. Great She's fun. one of my favourites. Alright, crystal ball, back to politics. Yep. We may have an election, say March, as late as May but maybe March. Um, I reckon Ken's... March. March? I reckon. Yeah. So... Don't hold me to that but if you're on the betting apps, maybe just oh, a little I think it's dabble. March. I think it's March. So, Ken Scott Morrison belie the polls again. Yep and retain power, or is he a goner? Of course he can. He did it once. Why can't he do it again? I mean, we always talk about this it's time factor. Well, it was the it's time factor last election, and look where it got us. I mean, Scott Morrison got elected again. Uh, the polls are a snapshot at a point in time. They're not predictive. So you've got to remember that. I think, uh, you know, he does start 
behind in a way. He's had a few redistributions in South Australia, in Victoria, also in Western Australia. He's got the Liberal Democrats trying to dilute exactly. his vote. Exactly. Clive Palmer doing the same. Yeah. Pauline Hanson. Look, I think eventually a lot of those votes would go back to him anyway, but he does start behind. He needs to win seats. I think it's all about Western Sydney. There's already a high watermark, don't forget, in Queensland. Mm. It's hard to see how they can win any more seats there. It was historically bad uh, for Labor at the last election. But on the other side, you know... You can't write either of them off. You Prime just, Minister Albo. Yeah. yeah. Doesn't have a ring to it. Not yet, anyway. Not yet, but mm. you never know. Yeah. Thank you so much for being Thank part you. of my program. This feels weird. It, it must feel weird <laughs> to you. Thank you for coming in. Thanks, Chris.